Okay, great. Thanks a lot. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about embedded data representations. And I'm presenting, but this is very much joint work with Yvonne Jensen and Pierre Dredgesevic. Um, so at a high level, um, until really recently, most of the discussion around visualization, both inside our field and outside of our field, has really focused around visualizations on paper and visualizations on the desktop. But I think we're reaching this point where work on data physicalization and augmented reality and digital fabrication are all showing that we can actually create representations that live in the physical world. Um, and so I think this is particularly interesting because an awful lot of the data that we deal with also has real relationships with locations and people and objects in the real world. And these tools can actually allow us to display that data um, in context in the physical world in a whole bunch of interesting ways. And the choices we make when doing that have a real impact um, on how we can use that information. So for example, I could present information about a restaurant's menu or ratings about it or its availability on my phone in the restaurant. Alternatively, I might use augmented reality to overlay that information on top of a whole bunch of restaurants on a street to support immediate comparison between them. And in fact, there are already a bunch of static information displays, like signs in store windows, that are presenting some of this kind of information um, in a way that I can compare from one restaurant to the next. And you could imagine going into future, uh, future ways of representing some of this data that are even more embedded and pervasive. So you can imagine, for example, overlaying wait times in front of all the restaurants on the street so you could compare them. And so right now we don't really have a good language for actually describing the differences between these different kinds of representations and comparing them. I think we also lack a good understanding of the benefits and trade-offs that are associated with each of these different kinds of visualizations that are associated with the environment. Um, and so the work that I'm going to talk about here is really trying to provide a conceptual framework that unifies a bunch of the existing work on visualization systems that acknowledge the physical world. So in particular, we're really interested in trying to focus on exploring representations of data that are somehow situated with respect to physical reference. So specifically situated with respect to the representations uh, so situating those representations next to or close to um, locations, objects, or people to which they're related. Um, you'll notice I'm using the term data representation here and not visualization. And that's specifically because we're also really interested in understanding um, how physicalizations play a role in this. And so I'm using representation as a blanket term to cover both of these categories, as well as things in between them. And then more specifically, we wanted to drill down a little bit and start to think about a new subset of situated data representations, which we call embedded data representations, that are actually even more tightly coupled to the physical reference. So in this case, you actually have uh, representations that are made up of a bunch of individual sub-presentations of data that might be independently placed next to individual reference in the physical world. Now, of course, the term situated isn't new, and it's actually been used in a number of different ways in our community usually in a broader sense. Um, so for example, Barrett Enns and Parang Irani really recently have talked about this related concept of in situ data analysis, um, which they say provides access to situationally appropriate data at ideal times and places. Um, similarly, Andrew Vendemer and Dan Hill have talked about situated visualizations as visualizations embedded in a real world physical context. Um, and our use of the term is a little bit more specific and it's more consistent with the definition used by um, Sean White and Steve Feiner back in 2009, where they talked about situated visualizations as specifically visualizations that are related to the environment um, and are based on the relevance of their data to a particular physical context. And so specifically, our goal is really to provide a conceptual model around, allows us to think a little bit more clearly about the relationships between data and representations and the physical world. As you probably have all thought, the, the, with the exception of some work on interaction and some work on perception, most of the thinking and most of our traditional models of visualization have mostly ignored the physical world. Um, but we were interested in asking, what if instead of just considering this logical world where you have um, data and you're somehow transforming it into a representation, you also considered the physical world outside of that? 
So what are the physical reference in the real world that this data is related to? And also, when you're representing that data, how does it manifest in the real world on a sheet of paper, as a physicalization, or as something on screen? And doing this allows us to start to think about the relationships, the conceptual relationships, the physical relationships, the perceived relationships between these reference and the presentations. Um, and think about how you might either minimize or adjust that distance in useful ways. Um, and this notion is a pretty simple, but I think a pretty profound idea. The, the distance between the representations and their reference actually matters. Um, in geography circles, uh, Tobler's first law provides some of this intuition, this intuition that everything's related to everything else, but near things we see as more related to um, than distant things. And so by reducing this distance and allowing people to act more directly connect representations and presentations with their reference, um, we might be able to make it easier for people to make sense of data and also take action on it in the physical world. So if we take a really specific example, say I'm a store manager who wants to reorganize my shelves based on information from the register um, and sales data. Now, typically right now, I'd perform this task in a really non-situated way where I'm actually doing all this analysis on a desktop machine somewhere a long way away from the sales floor. Um, and in this case, the physical reference are the products on the shelves. The physical presentation is just a visualization on a screen in a particular location. And in this case, these are really far away from one another. On the other hand, if I take that same sales data and I display it on a tablet that I can walk around the store with, um, I can start to actually reduce the level of indirection pretty dramatically. And I can start to understand the relationship maybe between sales and things like lighting or floor traffic. Um, and this might make it a lot easier for me to take action based on that data to reorganize the shelves. And in fact, we could reduce this level of indirection even more by using something like an augmented reality display to overlay sales data on top of individual products, or even do something that's more embedded physically, so using illumination or actuation of the shelves themselves to communicate some of this data. However, if we want to think about that more nuanced embedded model, we need a slightly more complicated version of this, where instead of thinking about one big representation or presentation of data, we might actually think about a model that has a number of individual smaller presentations of data, either individual marks or small visualizations, each of which is associated with a single referent. And doing this allows us to consider the indirection between each referent and its presentation independently, and think about the entire system as a whole. And so thinking this way allows us to also draw up a taxonomy of different kinds of data representations, where at a high level we can think about uh, representations as visualizations or physicalizations or somewhere in between. Um, we can also think about the level of integration between those representations and the reference, all the way from non-situated visualizations where there's not really any correspondence through the subset of, the, of all of these representations which might be situated and taken into the space um, where they're relevant, and then a subset of those that are actually embedded where individual reference have corresponding marks or small visualizations. Um, and using this framing, we can actually examine a bunch of existing examples of situated visualization tools. Uh, if we think about situated visualizations, it turns out that there are a whole bunch of classic examples of visualizations where the entire visualization is placed in a relevant context. One nice one is Tobias Skog's uh, activity wallpaper, which is visualizing ambient volumes and traffic in a cafe over time um, and presenting it using a big visualization on the cafe wall. And in this case, the cafe itself is the referent and it's located in. Um, similarly, Sandy Clay's and Andrew Vandemore's street infographics do something really similar and they're displaying data about the residents on a specific street using uh, a sign that's actually placed on one of the walls on that street. And in fact, you can see situated visualizations all around us in a bunch of standard visualizations and information displays. So things like automobile dashboards or even mobile visualization applications, which can become situated depending on the context that you take them into. Um, and there are also a number of examples of situated physicalizations as well. So things like the Tennyson Road charts created by folks at MSR Cambridge um, where they're using physical charts on a city street to show poll responses from residents in that particular neighborhood. Um, or David Holstius's infotropism work, 
which is actually using a set of lights positioned next to a set of garbage and recycling bins, where placing something into one of these bins illuminates one of the two lights, and the growth of the plant actually visualizes people's use and of these recycling bins over time. And there are also interesting examples that highlight how the referent doesn't necessarily have to be a thing or a location. It could also even be a person. Um, in this case, this travel pendant created by uh, using the site mesh.io is situated not necessarily because it's placed at some of the locations that it maps, but instead it's situated by being placed next to the person who visited those locations. Um, and it provides additional personal and semantic meaning by being situated there. Uh, we introduced the term embedded visualizations, but in fact there are also a number of existing examples of these in the research literature. Um, for example, things like Ramesh Reshkar's RFIG lamps, which uses handheld projectors to do things like uh, visualize information about boxes' contents on top of them. Um, and interestingly, while a couple of uh, Steve White and Sean Finer, I'm sorry, Sean White and Steve Finer's examples, which they characterized as situated visualizations, are actually meeting our definition of embedded visualization, including things like the sight lens application, where they're visualizing specific air quality measurements at the exact location in space where that sensor reading was taken. Now, physicalizations, by contrast, haven't really been that explored, uh, particularly not in the embedded context, in the research literature. And most of the examples we see come from sciences or from um, the arts. So interesting examples like this piece by Inigo Maglano Ovalle. Um, it's actually an array of wind vanes that are physically conveying wind direction and speed at a whole bunch of points in space. And so you can think about this as a visualization or a physicalization that's showing the wind speed using physical motion at a whole bunch of points in a grid. Um, and each one of those points is actually the referent. There are also a bunch of techniques that are used in engineering and the sciences to observe things like fluid flow that have this character, but at a much, much finer scale. So here, the dye actually is communicating fluid motion at an infinite number of points on and around a model airplane. Um, here, color changes millions of tiny points on each one of the shower tiles reflects the temperature at that point. Uh, and here, tracking powder placed on an animal actually traces the path that that animal moves through the environment. Um, giving a record of all of its motions. And interestingly, almost all of these examples aren't really standard visualization examples. In fact, they're a lot closer to what's been called indexical visualizations or self-illustrating phenomena, where there's not a specific data pipeline or visual output. Instead, these are more implicit. Um, and I think this is really interesting because it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. There are a bunch of technologically enabled ways that we can create things in the space we just haven't yet. A few other small points. So. Our conceptual model also allows it to, us to really consider things like the connections between reference and uh, the data, as well as more systematically compare the indirection between uh, reference and physical presentations. We talk about this a lot more in the paper, but I want to highlight just two points. One is that when we're thinking about the relationship between raw data and reference, we need to remember that there isn't necessarily just one referent for any data point. In fact, there might be many. If we think about something like automobile mileage, um, this number might be associated with something like the sensor that's actually capturing it. But in a lot of cases, that's not really relevant unless we're trying to do something like debug that sensor. And there are a bunch of other tasks where it might be useful to think about instead the vehicle or the tires or the roads or the driver over which those miles were accumulated. And again, all of these are, might be useful depending on the task. Um, and similarly, we can consider the indirection between reference and presentations in a number of ways. We might think about, for example, minimizing the spatial indirection between a referent and a presentation, placing them physically close together, or also considering temporal indirection between the two. And this is interesting because there are a bunch of cases where physical reference might actually be so large or so small or so distant that it's really difficult to see them and manipulate them. And we might actually want to consider facsimiles, so maybe even things like uh, this model of the entire Mississippi River Delta created by the Army Corps of Engineers that can start to serve as human scale stand-ins for reference that just aren't perceivable using our sort of standard faculties. Um, other examples in landscapes, like so the, the tangible landscape work from folks in North Carolina State actually provides a nice sort of handheld or tabletop sized analogy for this making the landscape a lot more visible and a lot more reachable 
Um, but at the same time, you might be losing information about the real environment by moving to the sort of facsimile, and you also lose the ability to actually take action in the environment immediately. Um, so since this is just a really brief overview of a rich space, I want to close with just a couple of observations about some of the benefits and trade-offs associated with these different approaches. Um, so if we compare non-situated and situated visualizations, non-situated visualizations are almost always going to provide us with greater display and flexibility because we're not constrained by the kinds of displays or necessarily the locations or hardware um, that are required to take something into a particular environment. On the other hand, by doing that and accepting those constraints to build situated visualizations, we can actually provide views that provide context much more implicitly and support ambient and casual use in relevant environments. And similarly, if we compare situated to embedded views, um, situated views are, again, much often going to be much easier to construct. It's much easier to guarantee the visibility of individual points or the reachability. Um, and you have a lot more encoding flexibility because the spatiality of these visualizations or visualizations isn't necessarily determined. On the other hand, if we do accept those and build more embedded visualizations and visualizations, um, you can create much more direct associations between reference and physical presentations. And you can also support things like physical navigation and exploration that might be really valuable. And finally, I want to really encourage anybody who is interested in this um, to consider the generative potential of this framework, and particularly the lower right-hand corner here which I think we as a field have only really begun to explore. Um, there's a ton of interesting potential work here. And I can imagine lots of different uh, ways of doing this. I imagine you know, putting small drones that might provide in-place information for first responders, or small embedded visualizations that might highlight muscle development for athletes, um, embedded visualizations that could provide information about the meals on your plate. I think it's a super broad space with a ton of promising applications. So I'm really excited to see our community try to tackle some of these. So if there's any time, I'm happy to take a few questions. <laughs>